going to talk today about um, tips and tricks of endoscopic uh, anatomical enucleation of the prostate. Basically, I will show you a kind of semi-live surgery. We can comment on together. And that's what I'm, I've been doing since last 15 years when I started uh, to do anatomical enucleation, starting with the tulium laser. And then I moved to holmium laser. And I usually perform like about 300 up to 400 cases per year since 15 years. So I will just show you what I uh, basically do. And uh, uh, we all know that uh, uh, laser nucleation of the plaster is clearly stated in the guidelines. In the United States, no matter about uh, the volume is, uh, you can perform uh, laser nucleation for a very small prostate. Actually, I prefer for uh, small glands, less than 30 uh, milliliters in volume to perform just a, a blood or neck incision. This is going to be more than enough and you can spare ejaculation in up to 94, 96% of cases. So basically for small gland, we can prevent complication doing just a, a single or double incision of the blood or neck. Uh, but what I like of the uh, e AUA guidelines is that they already stated that you can choose a TULIP or HOLIP depending on uh, uh, your expertise. And so I strongly believe that uh, even if you do a lot of procedures, when you are in the beginning of your learning curve, this is a really challenging procedure. If you are in the wrong plane, it will start bleeding. You may get confused in large prostate. I've seen so many complications coming in my hospital from you know, places that we started with the problems without a good proctorship program. So uh, we will see what, what uh, we can do on that. Why I prefer Olmium laser? Basically because nowadays we have a high quality evidence literature since uh, 1998. It's versatile all, uh, laser. We can do both uh, BPH and Stone's disease. It fits all prostate sites, and you can do whatever technique you like to do. We, we can do the M block, which is one that I don't really like that much. Uh, you can do the three lobe technique, as we already have seen. If we have large third lobe, we can start to do the third lobe, and then we can do uh, two lobes. Or you can do also ejaculation sparing technique if the patient required for and if the, the uh, anatomy of the gland may allow to spare some uh, uh, ejaculation. You can have uh, power modulation, high versus low. I do basically prefer low power because in my uh, mind, the less energy we deliver uh, to the patient, to the tissue, uh, the less inflammation we may cause right after. And so we're going to have less symptom after the procedures. And also with the new laser, we have introduced the pulse modulation. And uh, uh, these are uh, the laser that we have on the market nowadays. Basically, they are almost the same. We can move to a low power laser up to 70 watts, up to uh, 152 uh, watts. But basically, in my opinion, you can use low power and do uh, great procedures. Those are heavy machine up to 300 kilograms. Uh, so basically, when you buy a laser, consider to leave it in one operating room. Don't move to another to a room to another one because it may cause damage. So you need a lot of assistance in case. And uh, all the, the laser need at least 32 ampere as a, uh, for uh, electric stuff. So all modern uh, Olmium lasers are characterized by similar technical features. Uh, so selection should rely uh, mainly on personal preference and uh, experience. Uh, pulse modulation is something that has been recently introduced. And as um, we have just seen, uh, so the, the effect, it, the, the, all the machine now may have like the Moses, the virtual basket or the stabilization mode and deliver the laser in two peaks. Uh, the first peak separates the water, and the second one delivers the laser energy straight to the target. So these basically translate into increased efficacy, higher precision, and optimal energy delivery. And this is the settings that I basically use depending on the laser I have that day, and uh, because I used to have two operating room and operating one and one, so it depends on the operating room where I am. But basically, I like to cut with low power and short with pulse, coagulating low power with, uh, with long with pulse. And I used to have just a gentle mechanical anatomical dissection. So it's something different that we have just seen. 
and basically I will show you in the video why. Because if I just do a gentle dissection, I can clearly see the plan. And so I'm not gonna get lost in any case. So this is the principle that we use. I start uh, uh, doing the first uh, U-shaped incision at the Verumontanum. And this will help me to find, especially in large and long prostate, to find what is the apical uh, limit that, that I have to use. And then after that, if I have a third lobe, we will do the incision at five o'clock. If we don't have the uh, medium lobe, we will do the incision at six o'clock. After that, we proceed to release the mucosa at the apex. So it's very important, and I want to stress this concept, that to reduce the stress urinary incontinence, we have to early release the apex. And then we move to the left lobe and to the uh, third lobe enucleation. So here's the video. I always uh, tell to the residents to be sure where they place the inflow. So this is crucial. Sometimes they don't have vision, and then you take a look at the resectoscope, and then put the inflow where it's supposed to be the outflow. So this is another system that I use, uh, which is a flexible arc that help me to uh, keep me dry. Otherwise, I'm going to be always like a dirty of urine. Uh, we have seen the Otis. I like to use it, no matter what is the, the size of the meatus, but it helps me to prevent the stricture of the meatus. And then we go gently inside the urethra. Do never force. And if you have a stricture of the urethra, just cut the strictures. Never force. Otherwise, it's going to have a, a, a secondary urethral strictures. Then we start with the U-shaped incision at the apex. Uh, it's like a kind of no-touch technique. That's what I like to use. And I preferably use the coagulation mode. So very low power energy, 40 watts, 30 up to 40 watts. You can control this way just small bleeding. And then here the idea is to go straight to find the, the anatomical plane for enucleation. I go on both sides, on right side and on the left side. This is almost the entire procedure in about 10 minutes. I will show you the whole left lobe and like 80% of the right lobe. And if you, can, if you go slow and you just control exactly all the bleeding that you have, you're going to have a clear operating field, which is crucial for this kind of technique, not only for the enucleative part, but also for the more selection, as we already have seen, to have a clear view of the, of the bladder when you're morselating is crucial to avoid complication. So now, now we're moving on a left lobe, and I like to use the, the laser has a, a little finger, and you can uh, every time see and go back to find the right plane if you're uh, gonna get confused. Uh, so this is a kind of an easy case, you know? Not all the cases are like this. Uh, you may find like a 200 grams prostate and you have a beautiful uh, plan, and sometimes you go to operating like a 60 gram prostate and you think, okay, I'm gonna go very fast. And then you have like a, a lot of uh, inflammation. You are not able to find the right plane. So that's why I like to use a gentle mechanical dissection. Help me, you see, you, we are uh, counter wise clock on the, on the left side and I help myself with just small coagulation. Then when the apex is pretty clear, I go back on the bladder neck, and then I already know where is the right plane on the apex. So I made my uh, six o'clock incision, and I know where I have to stop, because already the plan posterior is clear. So now I go back and forward to trying to identify the, the plane. You see, still gentle traction, with the instrument and just coagulating, nothing more than this. You help yourself and the, the plane is almost clear. Just small, no touch coagulation. So uh, the penetration of the Olmul laser is 0 0.5 millimeter. In this case, it's like nothing. You're just coagulating a small vessel. And then go back and we try to identify the posterior plane on the middle line. So if you have comments in the meantime, I'm going to be very happy to, to 
to share with you some comments on this. And then once we cut, we will be able to find exactly where, where's the posterior limit. Now you see, it's clearly visible. Where is the right plane? Here, we coagulate a little bit. And then once we reach the plane, we can just gently move the prostate on both sides. Here we go. And the plane is always clear. Again, we create space. We create space between the lobes. The flow increases, and the visual the visualization is always pretty clear. So I didn't cut the procedure, so you may see that it's pretty, you know, fast procedures, and um, this is a kind of procedure that I like. I do a lot of robotic surgery. But uh, this is always, you know, a kind of a challenge that I have to, you know, do every day. Am I be able to find the right plane today? I don't know. Let's see what's going on. Okay, now we move to the apex. This is a very important part. And I strongly believe that the apex shape is one of the, the reasons why we may have different uh, uh, experience in stress urinary incontinence after the, the procedures. So it depends on the volume of the gland. And the larger is the apex, the more likely we will experience stress urinary incontinence. We know, uh, we have published a couple of studies of prostate shape after radical prostatectomy. And what we have seen is uh, once the apex uh, over come the, the sphincter, we may have more and more incontinence. But if the prostate shape is like an apple shape without overlapping the sphincter, this will help to recover the continence. I'm, you know, I'm sure that this is going to be quite the same for uh, a nucleation of the prostate. So if you have a large, large apex, this is going to create a different angle of the instrument stressing the, the, the sphincter. So we're gonna, what we're going to do on this side is proceed like we have done before. So gently moving the prostate, create tension, and then with coagulation, just follow the plane. Just follow the plane. And on the left side, we're going to go uh, counterclockwise like a pendulum from the base to the, to the anterior part. Now we move and we go on top of the gland. And I'm st still using just coagulation, so I'm not forcing anything. I, I don't think personally that uh, you need a lot of energy. Or you can use and you can increase power when you are on this side. So you're around or two o'clock. Uh, in, in this case, if you have a lot of tissue and a lot of adhesion, you can increase the power and be more effective on the tissue. And this is the rendezvous at uh, 12 o'clock. And here you can go a little bit faster, increasing the, the power. Here we are on the bladder neck. Uh, once you are able to find the plane, I don't think that uh, urethral orifices are crucial to be to see exactly where they are because you, if you are following the right plane, you're not gonna be in trouble with the orifice. But of course, if you are at the beginning of the procedure, you want to go back and forward and check, especially in large prostate where the orifices are. So we're done with the left lobe and then we proceed with the right one. Gentle use of the fibers again to find the right plane. And again, we're going to rotate the resectoscope and we're going uh, up to cut the mucosa for a, a quick release before to do anything else. And again, gentle traction with the instruments. And we go at the base of the, of the gland. And here is an example of a coagulation. Very easy. If still bleeding, you go back, and you sometimes have to follow the, the vessel, you know, until it stops bleeding. Here we go. 
and then I think we can move on. So we are on the bladder neck on the right slope. And it is a, this is kind of 15 minute procedure. So then more selection. More selection in my mind is the hardest part of the procedure, especially in large gland, fibrotic gland. gland. But let me tell you that um, one of the main concern was about the kind of morselator that we use. Now we have brand new one. We cannot talk about, you know, commercial name here, but that are on the market, new one coming from the East. May I say this? Which are, you know, crazy. They may morselate like 80 grams in two, three minutes. Okay, so this is a, a key point. Uh, but to achieve this kind of morselation, you definitely need an optimal control of bleeding for a clear visualization before starting morselating. So it's not a shame if after the enucleation, you go back with your resectoscope and you want to coagulate a little bit to be sure and have a clear visualization. Mm, so uh, I agree uh, that we have to connect in and output to fill the bladder at maximum uh, range. Uh, and you have to ask to your nurse to constantly check the inflow. So you have to have four bags of water coming to the bladder. And uh, one thing that I think is crucial is to rapid instruments change from receptoscope to nephroscope to avoid bleeding due to rapid decompression. And then keep the tip of the morselator in, uh, inside the resectoscope when you get in inside the bladder. This is crucial to avoid lesion of the bladder or if you just pull back the, the resectoscope to, under, to, to go underneath the, the bladder neck. And then you have to know the morselation, the, the morselation you have chosen. Uh, there are different on the market. Someone goes north-south, someone goes uh, east-west. So, so basically you have to know, and you have to know when it cut. So if it is on top or in front of. And then you have to keep staying in the middle of the bladder. This is another thing which is crucial. This is a very short video of, of uh, what we do. So you have to know where is the tip of the morselator. And then you have your assistant that take out the restetoscope and you go fast in so you don't lose the field. And once you're in, you start to uh, morselate. And uh, at the very beginning, it may be a little bit bleeding, but then once the receptoscope start with suction, the, the field is going to be much more clear, and you will go uh, very fast if your visualization is, is good enough. And then so the take home messages. So this is a kind of procedure that really has a steep learning curve and a mentorship program is of paramount importance. I think you will never stop learning when you do this kind of procedure. So uh, I want to be uh, very close to my resident uh, and I want to help him start with one lobe and then start with another lobe before to do the, the whole procedures. And then uh, if you have any difficulties, one is to focus on finding the right plane at least it in one portion of the gland. Once you know where is the right plane, you can always go back and go again from that plane. And uh, if you lose the plane, uh, and if you don't feel comfortable with any of the surgical step, just stop the procedures and consider to put the resectoscope in and continue the procedures just resecting. And uh, to control bleeding and hemostasis, you have to proceed slowly, especially at the beginning, and coagulating all the visible uh, uh, bleeding that you find on the way. And uh, technique for proper morselation means to have clear visualization, you have to, f to have the bladder fulfilled, and you need constant irrigation. So I want to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll be very you know, thankful if you want to ask something later on. Thanks a lot.